Hey, I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles. Hey, get this. Be ready. Ready? Not to Ephesians. All right? I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter 1. Today begins a new study through the book of John. The book of John is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, it's probably the most different gospel that we have. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, about how these gospels were written. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. They, they are together combined to tell a story. Many of the same stories you see in Mark, you see in Matthew, same stories you see in Luke. Some of them a little bit different and, and here and there, but when you go to the book of John, you see some radically different stories. And what's cool about the book of John is that it doesn't sugarcoat anything. You know, sometimes as in the, in the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, it's kind of like this mystery. It's, like, it's, it's building up to see, is Jesus going to be the Messiah? Is he going to be the one that was promised? Is he going to be the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah that was to come to save the earth? And by the end of these synoptic gospels, you see that Jesus Christ is resurrected and he is Lord and he is praised and he gives commission. And by the end of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord. But John <laughs> is very different. See, John doesn't wait until the very end to tell you that Jesus is Lord. John tells you from verse number one that Jesus is God. And that's one of the reasons why I love the book of John. Today, we are starting a series called The Light of the World. Very fitting for a time like Christmas to see how God came to us in the flesh, and he came in the form of Jesus he came as a lowly servant in a manger. We'll see that in a couple of weeks. But we are going to see how he didn't just come and he wasn't just a human child. He was the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And we are going to see that through this text today. The month of December, we are going to get from verses 1 through 18. That is, I'm saying it out loud so that I actually do it. Because if not, I'm going to spend so much time in the prologue. But we are going to get from verses 1 through 18. Today, we're going to focus on verses 1 through 5, all right? So John chapter five, 1, verses 1 through 5. There's many topics that we're going to discuss, and we're going to see it here. Light, life, mankind, death. These, these are uh, a lot of uh, comparing images that John has, but today we're going to really focus on this image and this recurring theme of what's called the Word. All right, the word of God. So John chapter one, starting in verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for the reading of your word. God, I thank you that uh, you give us the revelation of your word through your son, Jesus Christ. God, this morning, I pray that you may help us to understand, uh, that you may help us to, to comprehend, and not just intellectually, Lord, May this knowledge change and shape our lives into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. God, may we be formed. May we recognize that this calling, that this adoption, that this inheritance that we have in you, God, is, is not uh, merely beneficial to us, not merely uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card, not merely a... Um, a forgiveness of our sins, Lord, but it is a relationship with you, the God of the universe. God, that you loved us so, that you gave us salvation, yes, adoption, yes, inheritance, yes, uh, forgiveness of sins, yes, grace, mercy, love, yes, all of these things, God, but you gave us a relationship with you. God, you place your spirit with us. We are connected to you. 
through your spirit, God. May that spirit who lives in us and every believer, may, may he challenge us this morning. May he enlighten us. May he uh, convict us of sin in our lives and may he transform our minds to be in, in comfort, uh, conforming to the image of Jesus Christ to, to think like he does, to have the mind of Christ. Lord, change us, direct us, lead us through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of today's message is going to be a bold claim. We're going to defend it. It's the title of what John uh, gives us in verse number one. Jesus, the eternal God. Jesus, the eternal God. Much has been said about who Jesus was. As you look at historic uh, uh, history, as you look at what different religions believe, as you look at uh, what contemporary humanity believes, uh, they'll tell you many different things about who Jesus is. Uh, if you look at the, the Jewish religion, uh, contemporary Jewish uh, people, uh, they will tell you that Jesus was not God. Jesus wasn't even a prophet. Uh, famously, you guys know Ben Shapiro, a uh, political commentator. Uh, he was on the Joe Rogan show, and he famously said this line in his, uh, when Joe Rogan was asking him about who he thought Jesus was. He said, do you think he is a prophet? And he said, no, no, no. We don't even believe he was a prophet. What do, what, uh, and then he asked him like, what do you think he was? And he says, what do I think he was historically? I think he was a Jew who tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for his trouble. Just like a lot of other Jews at that time who were crucified for trying to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for their trouble. So in the, in the views of, of contemporary Jewish believers, they believe he was simply a, a criminal, somebody who tried to lead a revolt, wasn't even a prophet. In, in comparison, actually, Islam has a higher view of Jesus. Uh, if you look at the Islam religion, uh, the, 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 no, Jesus is, actually has a name. He is included in uh, the Quran, and it's, uh, he's known as Isa in Arabic, and he is considered one of the prophets. They consider him to be a prophet. And, uh, but they don't consider him to be divine. They believe uh, in, in, in the miracles and many different significant, uh, uh, he's a significant figure. He was a prophet, but they do not believe that he is God. If you look at uh, scholars, people who don't believe in God, who have no his, uh, religious background, they will tell you that Jesus was a historical figure. They cannot deny that Jesus of Nazareth existed. They can't deny it. And so they believe that he was a historical figure who was a good teacher. He was a, a good moral exemplar. He lived a good life. He did things that were good. And so because he did things that were good, how people see him as this idea of a, a, a good teacher, the Beatitudes, right? As you look at the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, some good teachings, some good wisdom, kind of looking at him like, uh, kind of like they did to the Stoics in that time. A lot of good wisdom for our time. He understood things better than we did. And so he has, he was a good teacher. He had a lot of good lessons for leading a good and virtuous life. Some think he was a humanitarian. You know, he saw himself as somebody who cared for the, for the sick, and he cared for those who were impoverished. He cared for those who were in captivity, and he went around loving on these people who nobody else loved. And he was just kind of like created these fables around him, and eventually it turned into this, these tall tales about some Jewish guy who did miracles and raised people from the dead. But that was it. All denying the divinity of Jesus Christ. But if you are in church today, if you believe that the written word of God is the word of God, then you cannot just think that Jesus is a historical figure. You can't just think, get from the words of scripture that Jesus was just a good moral teacher, that he was a virtuous person with virtuous teaching. You can't even just believe that he was a prophet, even though he was all of those things. What we see from the words of Scripture here in John 1, 1 is undeniable, unequivocal, that Jesus Christ is God. 
That is the main idea that John states here. Jesus is the eternal God. Now, for you, that may not click. <laughs> for you, you might think, you know, God the Father. And when you think of an image of God the Father, you think an old man on a throne, right? I, I don't know what image you get of God the Father. You see Jesus and you see, oh yeah, he came to be and, you know, he eventually was. But it was kind of like God bringing some sort of spirit into a man and then he became God. And There may be a lot of ideas that are circulating about how Jesus is God, but do not miss the idea that Jesus is the eternal God. When you think of the word Yahweh, when you think of God, think Jesus Christ. And this is what John is trying to get us to understand. As a matter of fact, the proposition for today, the big idea that we're going to cover today in the next few minutes is that the foundation of Christian living rests on the belief that Jesus is the eternal this is fundamental to our faith. The foundation of Christian living rests on the belief that Jesus is the eternal God. John cleverly gives us not only this big idea, but he also gives us evidences that this is true. He gives us a lot of different reasonings as to why this is true. If you haven't written it down, you got a couple more seconds. The foundation of Christian living rests on the belief that Jesus is the eternal God. And so we're going to see three arguments. The first one we're going to take our time with, and then the last two we're going to go rather quickly through them, okay? Because we want to get really into application. What does this mean for us, all right? And so we're going to start here in John chapter 1. Verse 1 and 2. Uh, the way that uh, Jewish writers wrote a lot of times is something called a chiasm. I don't know if you, if you know what that is. It's a, it's a lyrical structure that they use. And they use uh, something here, right? A word here, a word here, the middle part, which is very important, and then two parallel things here and two parallels here, okay? So that's the way verse 1 is written. Okay, verse 1 and 2, actually. And so look at how it says. It says, in the beginning was the word. This matches up with the last part where, where in verse 2 where it says, he was with God, where? In the beginning. So you see see how these two words line up? Okay, so this is like a little poem that he gives us, right? So it says, verse, back to verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Here's the big idea. Here's the, the big thing in the middle. And the word was God. Same thing. He was with God. Where? Verse 2. Give me verse two. He was, oh, you did give me verse two. I don't know. It's not showing up there. He was with God in the beginning, okay? And so we see that this structure formulates on this big idea that Jesus was, or the word was God. I'm getting ahead of myself, all right? And so the big thing that we see here is point number one, Jesus' identity is God's identity. John identifies Jesus as God. Jesus' identity is God's identity. As John wrote this, he writes this very strategically. Uh, what other book in the Bible do you know that begins with in the beginning? Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so just like as soon as I said in the beginning, you thought of Genesis, the readers of John would have immediately thought Genesis. In the beginning. Oh, whoa. Yeah, creation. Like their mind was already set there, right? And so in the beginning was what? The word. The word. Now, this is a key phrase here because this is going to be something that we're going to be looking at throughout this, this text. Specifically, this word, uh, word, it's hard to, to define the word, word, but uh, the word, word can mean uh, a lot of things, right? Uh, if for, for example, when I say a word, do you automatically think of the word or do you think of an image? I'll give you an example. When I say tooth, what, what came into your mind? The image of a tooth, right? When I say brush, what comes into your mind? A, a, the image of a brush, right? If I say toothbrush, what, 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 what does that come? 
the image of a toothbrush, right? And so, so you don't think like the word toothbrush isn't coming into your mind, right? What's coming into your mind? The image of a toothbrush. And so in the same way, when it says the word, it's not referring to a phrase or a linguistic uh, section of, of, of a phrase, right? It's talking about an actual being or the essence of something. The Stoics, uh, in this time, the Greek Stoics believe that the word logos or logos, which is where they, this, this word is translated from, meant that uh, that this would be a, a relational principle by which everything exists. So in their mind, everything exists because of this logic, logos, this word that everything existed. So they believed that this supreme intelligence existed that formulated everything through this knowledge. And so for the Stoics, they believed that they wanted to have this supreme knowledge. But remember that John wasn't just writing to Greek uh, hearers. He was also writing to Hebrew hearers. And for them specifically, the word of God brought about this association with creation, revelation, and deliverance. In other words, when we think of the log- logos of God, we know, uh, uh, we know as humans how we are to know God. When we think of the word of God, we think of God. In other words, the word logos is how we as humans are able to know God. Let me ask you a question. How do you know God? Think think about the ways that you know God. How can we know God? Well, we can look around, look at creation, right? And we can identify, hey, wait, you know, that tree is very detailed, very intricate. It's designed in a very specific way. And the way that I see it, and the more I study this tree, the more I recognize that the designer of this tree was very, very powerful. He, was very, he had a lot of attention to detail. He had an order. He had, uh, there was propagation in mind. There was multiplication in mind, right? When you look at something, you're able to determine its creator. Like, for example, if you were to look at, uh, anybody into watches? Nobody? Okay, a couple, couple, but like Roly, no, no, (laughs) no, just kidding. I'm not, I don't have the money for that. But anyways, so, so, but there's people who have a lot of, uh, who, who are really passionate about watches, right? And they'll look at the attention to detail in a watch and it'll tell you the value and the craftsmanship and the attention to detail that that creator had for that watch. In the same way, when you look around in the earth, you can see that the creator of this universe was very detailed. He had a very vast, right? And when you consider all of the things that he made, as we look out into space, as far out as we can see, we see intricate detail more than we could ever imagine. And it blows our mind, right? And when we look down into the microscopic level, we see what? Intricate detail of, like, it blows our mind as well, right? So every time we look at God's creation, it blows our mind because we can't comprehend how such a being could exist. We know about God because of his creation. That's what Romans 1.21 tells us. Romans 1.20, I believe 1.20, tells us that by his creations, we have evidence that God is real. But that's not the only way you know God. That's what we call general revelation. Anybody can see it, right? But you as Christians have something called special revelation or specific revelation. And this revelation is the word of God through his writings of his prophets and through his spirit moving in his prophets, giving you his revelation. How can you know of God? Well, through his word in creation. You can know of God through his word in revelation. And you can know of God through his word in deliverance. Through his deliverance of his people, and in turn, through his deliverance of us, now his children, we are able to know God more deeply. So how can you know God? Only through his word. We see this all throughout scripture. In Genesis 1, 4, it says, how did, God, how did God create everything? He what? He spoke, right? Genesis 1, 4 says, then God said through his word, 
let there be light. In the New Testament, we see that this is actually uh, Jesus in that creation. We'll get to that in a second. In Jeremiah 1.11, how did the word of God come to the prophets so that they can write this thing? Well, look at what Jeremiah 1.11, and it's all throughout scripture. It says, and what? And the word of the Lord came to me, to Jeremiah. We see this all throughout scripture, right? And you guys know that story when Samuel was sleeping and Eli was like, he was trying to bother Eli. He's like, hey, I hear you calling me and whatever. And there's a phrase that says there, and Samuel did not yet know the word of the Lord. This is how God communicated to his prophets through his word. And in his deliverance, look at what Psalm 107 20 gives us. It says, he sent out his what? Word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. And so the word of God has been active in creation, in revelation, and in deliverance. And this word of God we see is not just a, a, a phrase or a linguistic uh, attribute, but it is a person. The word of God is a person. How do we know that? Well, we see this in verse 14. We haven't gotten there yet, but we will get there. Look at what verse uh, John 1, 14 says. And the word became flesh. Who's that talking about? It's Jesus, guys. The word is Jesus. And it says, and he made his dwelling, his tabernacle among us. Jesus came and made his dwelling amongst us. The person, the word of God, the eternal creator became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And so we see that Jesus is the word of God, the almighty, eternal God. Jesus is identified as God. Now, when I say the word of God now, don't just think the Bible or don't just think the gospel, which it is, it is, all of those things. But think of Jesus Christ as a person. As a matter of fact, when you think of God, the image that should come into our mind is the image of Jesus. Now, you, before you think I'm going a little heretical here, I want you to see a couple of verses that justify this. Look at what Paul says in Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15, it says, the Son, talking about who? Who's the Son? Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That word image here is the Greek word icon, right? And when you think, okay, we got logos, we got icon, it's kind of like the same thing, right? It's kind of like, if I was to show you this image right here, what would you say that is? It's a logo, but specifically, like, what is it? Apple, right? How do you know that? It doesn't say that. Well, I mean, it kind of has a shape of an apple. You could have guessed, but what do you mean by Apple? Do you mean just an apple? What do you mean by that? The company, the one that creates all of these devices, right? The iPad and your watch and your computer. So you know from this image, when you think this image, you think of Apple. What about this image? Oh, you guys, you guys know McDonald's, right? Hey, this is probably the most well-recognized, the golden arches. What's their catchphrase? I'm loving it, right? And she even sang the song, ba 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 right? Because we know it's ingrained into our mind when we think of McDonald's, golden arches. What about this image? Nike, just do it, right? We know these things. Why? Because these icons represent a brand they represent an image. It doesn't just represent a word, right? It represents how you feel about these companies. It represents what you think, how your, your connection with them. Maybe you had a really bad experience at McDonald's, and as soon as I said McDonald's, that's what you thought about, right? Maybe you think it's horrible for you, and you think that's a place to avoid. You have these feelings associated with these icons, with these images. And in the same way, when you think of God, you think, of Jesus. Why? Because he is the image of the invisible God. I don't have this verse up here, but I want you to look at Colossians 2 and look at uh, verse 9. Colossians 2, 9 says this, for in Christ, if you guys can get up there, it's good, but if not, it's fine. Sorry, I didn't give it to you. It just came to my mind right now. It says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity of God 
lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. See, the whole Godhead says exist in Jesus Christ. Christ is God. He is not only the image of the invisible God. He's not only the, the logos of God. He is God. Now, before we get a little bit, uh, before we get a little bit uh, ahead of ourselves, we need to remind ourselves that this doesn't mean that he is all three people, right? But he is, well, we're going to get into the Trinity, which is a little confusing. But whenever you think of God, we think of Jesus. But you might say, well, I mean, isn't the Father different from the Son? I thought there was some difference. Yes, there is. But look at what Philip was told when he asked this question in John 14, 9. We'll get to this eventually. It says this in verse uh, 8, actually, starting it says, verse 8, it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus says, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen what? Seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10 says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Listen, Jesus is God. We cannot make this any more clear, but we will. All right? Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 1 again. It says, In the beginning was a word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. If you ever needed a verse to show that Jesus is God, John 1.1 1, 1 is your verse. But you might say, okay, but I've met a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, they kind of argue about this verse. They tell me that it's not what it says. They tell me that in the old, in the original writing, it doesn't say that he was God. It says he was a God. Um, but it's grammatical gymnastics that they're playing with. Because just what they say is that because it doesn't have the article, the God, it could just refer to any God. But that's not the way that John writes. As a matter of fact, we see many instances where it never says the God and it's translated into God. And so there's many examples that you could see in scripture that it's not talking about a God, it's talking about the God. So don't worry about them bringing, and listen, if, if you are worried about those things, we need to get stronger in our faith. We need to understand this a little bit more so we can defend our faith. That's what First Peter tells us, to be ready and prepared to share with everyone the hope that is inside of you, all right? And so we believe in not only Jesus being God, we also believe that God the Father is God. And we also believe that God the Holy Spirit who dwells in us is also God. This is what we articulate in theology as the Trinity, the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of key ideas here on the Trinity that is important for us to understand. We believe that there is only one true God. That's important. This is why we are monotheist. We believe in one God. Monotheism, mono, one theist, God, monotheist, one God. We believe that there is one God. We also believe that this one God exists in three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we also believe that all three persons are completely equal in attributes and have the same divine nature. So Pastor Lewis, is it three or is it one? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. They're, they're, it, it's, 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 it's hard to understand. As a matter of fact, we can't fully articulate it. Theologians have tried for, for centuries and for millennium to try to articulate these ideas and we can't fully understand, we can't fully comprehend in our mind how God can be one God, and yet three distinct persons, but it's what God reveals in his word. And here's what I'll tell you. His word trumps our logic. We may not understand it, but that's who God is. And so it's not up to him to fit into our mold, into our mind, how we are able to understand, but us to try to articulate and try to understand him. 
We may never fully, but it's, it's, it's a struggle. Welcome to the club. We all struggle together. And so we understand that Jesus is God. Is that clear? Do, 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 do we, did we come to this conclusion? The identity of Jesus, multiple times in the, in, the, in, in the Bible, we see that Jesus is God. That's his identity. But not only is his identity God, his actions are also God's actions. Look at what verse 3 says. Through him, through the what? The word, which is, what did we determine the word was? Jesus, through the word, everything, or I'm sorry, all things were made. Without, in case you missed it, he says it again, but backwards. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so we see in ver, uh, point number two is that Jesus' actions are God's actions. What Jesus does is what God does. The identity of Jesus is God's identity, but his actions are also God's actions. We see specifically here through the action of creation. What does Genesis 1, 1 says? In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, right? It says God created. That was his role, right? But look at what Colossians 1.16 says. Now looking in the New Testament, it's the New Testament writers looking back, they say, say this, for in him, talking about Jesus, all things were created. So who created it? Was it God or was it Jesus? Again, yes. It was, it was Jesus in the creation, and it was God. For in him, all things were created. Things where? In heaven and things on earth. Things that are visible and things that are invisible. What's invisible? Ah, there's a lot of things that you can't see. There's a whole concept of science called dark matter that we can't comprehend, but we know exists. Jesus created all that as well, all right? Just think about that. There's, thing, there's things you can't see, right? But not only that, look at, look at what it says, whether thrones or powers, or rulers, or authorities. That's not talking about uh, any president, any uh, government. This is talking about spiritual forces. It's talking about the, he created not only the people, but he created all angelic beings. All other beings in heaven, he created them as well. All things have been created through him and for him. And so he is the one who created all things. So God creates, Jesus creates, which is it? It's the same thing. He creates all things. But not only do we see him in creation, his actions are God's actions, we see all throughout the New Testament how they look back at Old Testament stories and that when they say God, they say, no, 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 it was Jesus, right? So I'll, get, I'll give you an example. So for example, you, you guys know when... Um, when the people of Israel were delivered from Egypt? You guys know that? Okay. Who, who delivered the people from Egypt? Don't, don't get your new knowledge. Like, just in general. Who, who, who delivered the people from Egypt? It was God, right? But look at what it says here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. Talking about Jesus, right? It says, he regarded disgrace. Actually, it's talking about Moses, right? It says, he regarded disgrace for the sake of who? So, wait, Moses knew Christ? Apparently, he did, right? So when, he, when it's talking about Moses was in relationship with God, it's in the New Testament, we see the, the writer of Hebrews says, that God that Moses had a relationship, that was Christ. That was Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. It says, because he was looking ahead, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Again, talking about Jesus. Jude tells us the same thing. Look at Jude 1.5. He says, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord, is specifically talking about Jesus in this context, at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Wait a minute. Jesus delivered the people? Yes. Jesus has always been there. He's not a new character unlocked in the New Testament. He is a character who has been there all along, all through the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus is the eternal God. What about further? What about when Moses, I'm sorry, when, when Abraham met God and they, you know, that whole Abrahamic pact and all of these things? Oh, look at the words of Jesus in John 8, 58. It says, very truly, to, I tell you, 
Jesus answered him, before Abraham was born, I am. Oof. I am. This is a big phrase in, in the book of John. We'll get into it. There's like the seven I am statements of Jesus. Remember, if you, if you are missing the point completely, you see people's light, eyes light up. It's I am is the name of God, all right? So in case you missed it, that's what he's saying. Before Abraham was born, I am God. I've always been. I always will be. He is eternal. And so the actions of Jesus are the actions of God. But not only is the identity of God the identity of Jesus. Not only is the actions of Jesus, the actions of God. Look at verse four. It says, in him, Jesus, or the word, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. In this text, we see another principle that Jesus' substance is God's substance. Who Jesus is, is God. John specifically states that life and light are both in Jesus. In him was life. In other words, Jesus is the author of life. We see another passage in, in Colossians where it says, and in him all things hold together. The fact that your body is not flailing apart into different molecules and this world isn't spinning out of control is because in Christ, all things hold together. John identifies this creator, this life, this light as Jesus. When God creates the heavens and the earth, what's the first thing he says? Right before that, let there be what? Let there be light. The substance of God as he creates, as he puts everything into order, as he gives light and life, the substance of God is the same substance as Jesus. In him was light, and that light was the life of all mankind. Or is it backwards? I think I said it backwards. Same idea. You know, I saw a video the other day. It was like a little YouTube short. I sent it to my wife. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it has nothing to do with the message, but I thought it was really cool. <laughs> so, so I, I, I saw that the scientists had discovered that at the moment of conception, when, uh, you know, not to get too graphic here, but like when, when the sperm enters the egg and there's actual conception that happens, there is a burst of light that happens. The scientists have seen it, not only in, in animals, they've, they've seen it in, in humans as well. There is light that comes from that life. And I don't know what that has to do with it, but I thought it was pretty cool how life and light connect together. Uh, this is, this is uh, foreshadowing as well because John is a very good writer. John, you, you know how like in good movies, they kind of foreshadow a plot twist that's gonna come at the end of the movie and you don't really see it. And then you look back and you're like, oh, that, he, he kind of foreshadowed that thing. At the end of the movie, he foreshadowed it. In the, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like there's some elements that happened before and then eventually, okay, now you get what I'm saying. In the same way, John writes these things and he's kind of foreshadowing some of the things he's gonna talk about. And so even though he's giving us that the substance of God is light and life, he's foreshadowing this idea that Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. He's foreshadowing all of these things. and It's so cool. I'm so passionate. I'm so excited for this book of John. I don't know if you could tell. But here's what I want. I want to stop there with the information. Why? Because as much as knowing that Jesus is God and having the information in your mind, it does nothing unless it transforms our lives. Information cannot change you unless it transforms into application. What does this mean? If we believe this to be true, if we can understand and comprehend and be convinced of the fact that Jesus is God, let me tell you, that changes our lives. At least it should. Think about it. The God of the universe, the one in whom was life and was light, the one who designed the trees and the stars and the cells and the atoms, the one who revealed his word to us became human. He took on flesh. 
He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross. He resurrected from the grave. He took the punishment that you and I deserve and he took it upon himself. Crucified as a sinner. Raised to life as almighty God. It could have been done there. But then he says, hey, I make this available to you. If you deny yourself, if you stop living the life that you were living, if you repent and turn from your sins, and you receive this gift that the author of the universe has given to you, this gift of grace, and you say, you know what? I repent for my sins, and I trust in faith. I can't for sure 100% know that this is a fact, but I trust in faith that God will say, will do what he says he's going to do, which is to save me and redeem me and all of these different things, then I will follow him all of the days of my life. If you do that, if you repent and you put your faith in him, you will now be in relationship with the author of life. Let that blow your mind for a second. He wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want to give you rules for you to follow and and, and stipulations for you to be able to to, to continue doing all of your life. He doesn't want to make you not have fun and, 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 and ruin your friendships and all that stuff. He wants to give you life. He is the one who defines what life is. Are we going to receive that life? Are we going to receive that light and recognize that the God of the universe, the almighty God who in an instant could say, eh, I'm not going to hold you together anymore and just... Psh. I know, graphic image, sorry. I forgot where I was going. Are you going to allow... Are, are you going to continue in your life this way? Or are you going to come into the realization that Jesus Christ... God Almighty wants to have a relationship with you. See, that truth should change how we live. That truth that Jesus is God should impact how we make every decision. It should impact how we treat our family members, how we treat our church members, the people around us. It should change how we love. It should change how we act towards each other. And I say should, but this is, this, is what, this is what I'm trying to get to. Without Jesus Christ, the God Almighty, living inside of you, you can't. And so when that change happens, when you understand the truth of the gospel, when the gospel transforms your life, you're a totally different person. Because now God Almighty lives in you. What needs to change in your life? Maybe what needs to change in your life is everything. And you need to surrender your life to God. And you need to recognize that today is the day of salvation for you. Maybe that's what needs to change. But maybe you are transformed. Maybe you have God in you, but you've never truly understood this idea that the God of the universe lives in me. And now that idea is just blowing your mind and it should change how we act. It should uh, uh, change the way that we are, are, are communicating with each other. How are you going to respond to this truth? What in your life needs to change right now? Have you been living thinking that God is just a cool guy in the sky who is just kind of there with me? And No, he is almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent God. You know that idea of omnipresence should either scare you or should bring you so much joy. Because no matter what you're going through, God's there with you. But if you're trying to do things that are against God, the idea that God is there should scare you. Because God's always there. And so how does that transform your life? This Christmas season, we don't want to just think of God in a little manger, vulnerable. A little, you just put him under the tree and we put him away until next year. Jesus is the almighty, all-powerful God who doesn't live in your storage, who doesn't live in your basement. We don't have basements here. If you're watching online and you have a basement, he doesn't live in your basement, all right? He doesn't live in your attic. He doesn't live in your storage compartment in your garage. 
He lives in you if you are a Christian. And every single day of our lives this Christmas should reflect that truth. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. (sighs) Lord, we are in awe that you would choose to love us. God, that you would choose to die for our sins. God, may this reality that Jesus, you are God, radically transform how we live our lives. God, I pray for anybody in here who may not know you, who may be wandering around life trying to find fulfillment in all of these different things and career and fame and uh, success and wealth, whatever it might be, God. Whatever they're trying to find their identity in, whatever they're trying to find their rest in, whatever they think their effort or, 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 or willpower will get them, Lord. God, those who are resting on the things that this world has to offer, God, may today be a day where you remind them and you change their trajectory forever. May you help them to realize that satisfaction is not found in any of those things, but in the one who created us, the one who designed us, the one who knows what we need for satisfaction. And your word reminds us that what we need is you. God, we want you. Nothing else. So God, in this moment, in this Christmas season, help us to recognize that you are the one we need. Lord, if we we have been walking with you, if we have you in our hearts, but yet we have been ignoring or downplaying the power that you hold and who you are, Lord, help us to recognize that truth and may it transform the way that we live. God, I ask you, to help us as a church to be able to magnify your name in all that we do, to be able to glorify you, to bring glory to your name as we sing to you, as we pray to you, as we we give to you, as we serve to you, as we fellowship together with you. May everything that we do be to your glory. Why? Because you deserve it. You alone deserve our glory and our worship and our adoration. God, you are almighty God. So, Lord, remind us of that this day. As we continue to go through this book, as we continue to go through the Gospel of John, continue to remind us that in everything that we do, may we glorify your name. And it is in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that at the name of Jesus that every single knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As Acts 4 tells us, the name in which salvation rests, that there is no other name in which we, by, under which we can be saved. In that wonderful, glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand. Let's worship.